it. Oh, Bonnie has joined us. Hello. Hi, Bonnie. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. Thank you so much for joining the Peloton Moms Book Club. We were so excited to choose this as our April read in the book club, Lessons in Chemistry. Thank you. I can't, I mean, Peloton Moms, I'm in awe of you guys. (laughs) Well, we are in awe of you because I know that you row and we will circle back to that in our chat. (laughs) Um, congrats on getting this book as a Good Morning America selection this this thank month as well. You. Thank you. That was a big surprise for me, and it was a really pleasant surprise. So thanks very much. Yeah, we um, we have some you know net galley readers in our group, and a few of them read this a few months back, and they were like, "This is going to be big. You should read this. You should put this on your pre order list now." And lo and behold, it is. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, it's been a big shock for me the entire time. So every day it's like a new what, you know, but uh, it's been, it's been incredible. It's been incredible. And correct me if I'm wrong. This is your debut adult fiction novel, right? Yeah, better late than never. That's what I keep exactly. saying. But um, yeah, it is. I had written, you know, I've been a copywriter all my life and I had written another book before this, but it got 98 rejections um, from agents who never read it um, because it was really long. No one wanted to read a 700 page novel from a debut novelist. So I started another book and made it shorter. (laughs) That turned out to be the sweet spot. So yeah, it's good. Fantastic. Well, do you think that you'll you'll ever circle back to that original book or have you just kind of put it out of your mind? No, I'm going to circle back to what I think. Um, I really like the characters in that book, but for now, I'm concentrating on some other ideas and also mostly just doing lessons in chemistry right now. Definitely. Um, I had a, I saw some, everybody was, hi, Bonnie, we loved your book, adored your book, favorite one of the year so far. Um, Laura Beth had asked, how did you find out that you were a GMA and book of the month club pick? I got an email from my publicist saying, you can't tell anyone but you've been picked. It was really early on. It was, gosh, I think I got the email in November of uh, the year before. And they said, you can't tell anyone, but um, you're a GMA book club pick. They already picked you. And I, I said, um, I can't tell anyone. (laughs) So I literally, I couldn't tell anyone. I mean, I told, I told a few people, I told my husband and my kids and, and everything, but yeah, it was very, very exciting. Yeah, I bet. We have a lot of people um, in the group that love Book of the Month Club just because it's a book that we, uh, uh, you know, a majority of us can like read together and then discuss yeah. it. So yeah, good. yeah, no, they were wonderful. Yeah. Um, Amy said, thanks for writing such great t- characters. Uh, such a fabulous read. Loved it. Um, uh, we did a rating poll earlier in the group and it was four stars and up, four and five stars from everybody. So that's so pretty much. rare. Oh my gosh. Well, uh, Good Morning America is having me back. Actually, I'm doing an event with them tomorrow on Instagram Live with Deb Roberts. So I'm I'm excited about that. But thank you for all the ratings because that means a lot to me as a writer. It really does. I appreciate it. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the inspiration for this book. I mean. Okay. Well, um, so Elizabeth Zott had existed before in another book, and that's not even the book I'd actually finished, but in yet another book that I had shelved, I hadn't finished that one. But she came back to me one day at work when I had a really bad day uh, at work. I'd been in a meeting where um, I'd experienced some sexism. I'd presented some ideas and then there was dead silence. It was a room full of men. There were no other women in the room. And then a vice president um, presented his ideas that he said he had just come up with. They were all the ideas I just expressed and he took full credit for them. And so did, and everyone in the room agreed that, well, they must be his ideas. So I was really angry. I said, you know, I just finished presenting those ideas and they just completely ignored me. So when I went back to my desk, I felt like Elizabeth Zott, who I hadn't spoken to in years was sitting there. And she said, I've had a bad day too, but let let me tell you how bad it gets. And that's one of the reasons why I said it back in the sixties, because I felt like she was talking to me about you know, things have improved for you, but not enough. (laughs) And that's the day I wrote the very first chapter of Lessons in Chemistry. Wow. One of the the main topics that we were discussing in the book club before you joined us was um, 
the sixties and the workplace dynamics and the home dynamics and, and what it was then and what it is now. And so just speak to us a little bit about what you were trying to convey in that aspect of the book. Well, for me, so, you know, I said it then for two reasons. One was because at that moment in time, I needed reassurance that we had actually made any progress since the sixties. And then I said it also at that time, because that's when my mom had been a mom and I think I needed to understand what her limits had been. And I hadn't ever appreciated the limits that she lived under. She'd been a nurse, but she'd had to give that up. Um, I think she wanted to be a doctor, but she told me that women weren't smart enough to be doctors. That was obviously something that she had been told. And so I said it then because I realized thinking back on all those moms in the neighborhood, all of them had a minimum of four children. Some of them had six or seven. They all stayed at home. They didn't have any help. And there were a lot of dreams that they, that were shelved for them. And I think when I started to really appreciate the fact that they had no choice in determining, you know, from everything from their last name to what they could really do, they had no, no way, they had no paycheck. And they had no legal right to their husband's paycheck. So if their marriage ended, they had to be sure that they could get alimony, but they weren't, they weren't in a legal position to actually get it. Um, so there are all these things that they lived under. Like I remember my mom writing a check and then my dad would always have to co-sign it, which can you imagine? <laughs> um, so I, I kind of wanted to salute those women who had given up everything for all of us kids and really look at them for the first time and say, you know, thank you for making the sacrifices you did and for being overlooked because I have to say that back then they did, they were called average housewives. They were not average people. So I, that's why I kind of wanted to salute those women, but I also needed that reassurance that things have changed. Mm -hmm. They haven't changed enough. <laughs> yeah. I agree. They haven't changed enough, but I hear what you're saying. I mean, I feel like that there's still the stigma associated with a mom, a stay at home mom, Absolutely. whether she chose to be that way or circumstances made her be that way. And I, I disagree with that stigma. I mean, it's important work to raise kids and make that sacrifice if it's a sacrifice. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I, I think, you know, I read a lot of books and I always wonder like, why did I like this book versus that book? And um, someone else, Laura Beth had touched on it earlier. Your deep character development was the best. I mean, all of the characters in this book had such a distinct voice and I could see them so clearly in my head from Elizabeth to Calvin to Mad to 630. So, I mean, I just, I'm like, how did you do it? <laughs> like, you got us to care about everybody. You know, it really helps coming from a copywriting background. Um, I've always had to create voices for different things. And uh, so that, that really helps. Uh, but I think for me, when I'm developing a character, I really, I always say this, I have to make them round. And the reason why I have all those points of view was because Elizabeth was going to be the main character. And I thought you needed to see her the way all these other people saw her. Some people hated her. Some people loved her. Some people were afraid of her and a lot of people were inspired by her. But in order to get all of that, I had to have all these people comment on her because she is, you know, she's just who she is. She's very rational and straightforward. Um, and if I had just presented her without everyone else looking in on her, then she wouldn't have been round. But to have those other people be round, I had to understand and have empathy, even for the bad characters, for their backgrounds and how they were raised and what made them the way they were. Mm -hmm. You did a great job. I appreciate that. <laughs> <Thank you>. um, <laughs> um, so we, we also talked about um, it, if anybody had recognized Wilson and kind of pegged it from the earlier on in the book, how things were going to progress. I did not see that coming. Did when you sat down to write this book, did you always have that ending in mind? Did you write it linearly or did you just kind of let it create itself organically? It was the, the latter. I don't write from an outline. And I, I think it's really, some writers do it. I'm incredibly jealous of those people. But for me, I like to explore a lot of possibilities and go down a lot of roads and see if they're going to lead somewhere, somewhere interesting. And by doing that, 
you know, it led me in, in these directions that I know I wouldn't have found if I had just written an outline and stuck to it. So that's what I tell my agent anyway. Um, but it, it is true. It is true that it's really necessary for me to, to make connections that I, I might not be able to think of while I'm writing an outline. The other thing is once I'm writing a character and they start talking. Ten in their shorts, Dave. Sorry. Hey, Lauren, can you mute real quick for me, please? <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, so that's, I mean, let's see now I, now I'm, now I'm losing your question, but that I just make sure that I, I don't write from an outline and I try to explore. I did have the idea at the very end that she would return to the lab and that's all I knew. Okay. Yeah. Returning to lab. I love that part. I loved that. Um, you know, now that she's, you know, because she lost her family in essence, and Calvin lost his family in essence, that she's going to have these new family members in her life at the end of the book. And um, so to jump ahead a little bit, I've heard that this is going to be optioned or it is optioned with um, Apple TV. Yeah. Is that right? I am so excited to, you know, see the recreation or the interpretation of this book. And then hopefully to see what happens after the last page, because like, I, I would, I want to know more about Elizabeth and her family. So well, the, the series is moving right along. It was optioned, but they put it in for, into production. So um, they're starting shooting this July in LA and they'll have it done next summer. Fantastic. Are you going to be involved in that in any aspect or you just kind of want to see what somebody else does with your baby in their hands? Oh man, is it hard to turn over your baby? Um, that was really hard. But no, what happened with that was um, usually they don't option books so quickly. Um, they wait until they perform a little bit in the market and they see how people like that. For whatever reason, when I was at the Frankfurt Book Fair and we were... Um, in the British auction, and then suddenly we were in the American option just for publishers. Then all of a sudden Hollywood was calling. That surprised my agent. It surprised me. It surprised everyone. Um, and they said, and I got 35 offers. I mean, before I had chosen my American publisher, um, but I was then assigned a film agent and he made it a must produce order. And that immediately took out everyone but eight companies and then it was just kind of I talked to all eight it was a very uh exciting time it was also super stressful all those people you see on the red carpet suddenly they're on your zoom screen and you know they're all there and they're saying well here's what we would do and you know what you know how how do you see this unfolding and I thought I cannot believe this is my life I mean I cannot believe I'm talking to these people uh, they were all great but I ended up going with aggregate films um, that's Jason Bateman and Michael Costigan and Susanna Grant, the writer um, who did Aaron Brockovich. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Brie Larson uh, asked for an exclusive read, which is uh, a really big deal in Hollywood. If you get an actress attached to your, to your show, it changes the dynamic in Hollywood overnight. It's, you know, it's no longer you, you, there's no bickering at, at all. You know, the, the, all the streaming companies are like, she's attached or he's attached for going forward. So she wanted to have an exclusive read and they gave her 48 hours. Yes, sir, you know, you're in or out because there were a lot of actresses lining up already. And she said, I'm in and I want to talk to the writer. So she Zoomed me. It was just her and me. It was great. Um, and she just said, I, you know, I, I think I'll be really good. I, I think I can be Elizabeth Zott. And the more I talked to her, the more I felt like that was true. So she's out there erging right now. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Oh, I'm, sure I'm sure she's doing a great job erging and I'm, I'm hoping that she'll be a wonderful Elizabeth Zott. I can definitely see her saying, you know, that catchphrase, Children's at the table. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, it's funny. She just put a video of herself on Instagram erging. And I went, oh my God, she's erging incorrectly. It was so funny. All these other rowers saw it. Oh my God, she's erging incorrectly. Um, so I wrote the producer of the show and I said, she needs a rowing coach. And he goes, we're on it. We're on it. <laughs> so she, someone's showing up tomorrow. I was going to say, yeah, she definitely would have to have a, a rowing coach. Um, so, you know, we read a lot of books and um, so we see Peloton references in books and we always get a little excited about that. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, 
Why did you choose rowing for Elizabeth? I chose that because it was the only thing in the book I did not have to research. I, I'm not a chemist, so I had to research chemistry. I'm not a single mom, so I really need to understand what life is like for a single mom. And I don't like to cook, most of all. So I really had to work on that part of it. And when it came to rowing represents in the book um, a community, but also cooperation. And in the book, um, Elizabeth's workplace is quite toxic. And that's a, an area of non-cooperation. So it was a point counterpoint to what makes a boat move forward? Well, it's not just strength and ability, it's actually the rowers absolutely must cooperate with each other. Um, and there was this sort of metaphor I was thinking about, about how all of us humans, we're all in the same boat, literally, and we all really don't cooperate that well being in this boat, which is why we, we keep sliding backwards and that's what happens in rowing when rowers don't cooperate. The boat does not move in the right direction. So it was a, it was a metaphor for me, a theme throughout the book of cooperation versus non-cooperation and what that looks like. Mm -hmm. I could see that. I have, uh, only rowing I've done is like on a rowing machine and I can imagine it's much different in an actual boat. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is quite different. Um, well, uh, you know, when we have an author join us for book club, I like to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to chime in and ask Bonnie directly. If you had any questions for Bonnie, please, you know, raise your hand so that I can call on you and you can come off mute. And Laura Beth, come off mute and say hi to Bonnie. Hi, Bonnie. Hello. Absolutely loved it. Rower here, a beginner oh. rower. Oh my but, gosh, good for you. Yeah. So it's my first book reading rowing after, after learning. So it's awesome. Um, but where I wanted to come from was with the research, like all the science, are you, where's your background? I mean, how do you explain such, I don't know, all the theories and things that Elizabeth and Calvin discuss and make it to where an everyday reader can understand and grasp what's going on and keep it interesting? How, oh, did, how well, did you thanks. master that? Well, you know, a long time ago, um, I worked as a science writer only for a few years. Uh, but at that time, I, I kind of got a lot of respect for, for science. I mean, my, my dad was a scientist as well. So, but I didn't really have any background in science. I do have background in writing. And as a copywriter, you never, ever write what you know. You always write something new. So researching chemistry, that just made sense to me. And doing it at that time frame, all I did was buy a book off of uh, eBay, an old textbook from the 50s. And I taught myself basic chemistry from that textbook um, so that I could write those scenes. But it's really important to me, chemistry is a metaphor and it's also the basis of all life. And it was really important to me to, to have people see that chemistry is directly related to us in everyday life because I think we tend to forget that we're just atoms and molecules. Um, all of us are, and it's a little bit spooky when you think of it that way, but it's also a symbol of how, how easily we adapt and change, how open our bodies and our minds are to change. And yet our society is quite closed and doesn't feel, it feels sluggish a lot of the time. That is not our natural state. So the message of the book is, you know, you are a catalyst, a catalyst. You're actually born as a catalyst and you can, bring that forward in your, in your everyday life. And you don't have to fear change so much, but also you're very good at it. So trust yourself. I love that. And I loved when Elizabeth was talking about trying to keep her job when she was pregnant. And she says, I'm in an office of scientists supposed to be innovative thinkers and here everything is so close-minded. So <laughs> exactly. Was, well, you know, great. interesting. I've been he hearing from a lot of women scientists. I've probably gotten over 200 messages now. And it's very disappointing to hear that so many of these women have said that, that the lab that I was describing in the sixties is the lab they're working in today. And wow. yeah, that their research has been stolen. You know, they've been inappropriately touched. Um, they're talked over in meetings. They don't get promotions. Um, they don't get funding. It, the, the list is just astonishing. So that part has been a, a little bit disturbing, honestly, but they really love it that the book is out there and people are saying, you know, well, of course this should be, you know, fair and equal. And so they feel like 
it's giving them a voice, which I, I love, of course. So it's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. So another part that we had discussed um, in book club was uh, 630, of course. Uh, um, how could you not love 630? And um, I know that he was originally training to be a bomb dog. So we were, we were kind of curious. You know, I asked everybody what they imagined 630 looking like in their head because I didn't I don't recall you specifying his breed. And I said, he kind of, in my mind, I thought of Spuds McKenzie from way back in the day. And <laughs> so just talk to us a little bit about 630. Um, you know, why did you choose to incorporate him into the book? How did he come to be? And Okay. Well, 630 is actually based on my old dog, Friday, who since died. But, um, um, and my dog did not look like the dog I I describe 630 to be in the book and every British person, uh, you know, I live in London um, right now, but every British person in the world knows what a 630 is. They're called lurchers in, in Britain. And they're this, this really kind of scraggly looking big mutt of a dog. They're sight hounds, but they're, they're mutts. And, and some of them are, are really shockingly odd looking. Um, and so it was so funny when I was writing this, I thought, you know, I was describing a lurcher and then I realized there aren't lurchers in the United States. And so I just heard from the Hollywood people a couple of weeks ago, they're in the middle of casting the dog. They've gotten more dog headshots than they have for people. <laughs> and they said, it's been really, um, it's going to be really tough to choose the dog, but they, they have a general idea. I sent them pictures of lur lurchers and now they have a good idea, but yes, the dog was based on my dog Friday and my dog Friday knew a lot of words. And these weren't words that I went out of my way to teach my dog. Um, but she just turned out to be super smart. We got her from a shelter. She was in really bad shape and she became very devoted to us. But the one thing that we noticed about our dog was that she watched us all the time. You know, you look away or you, know, you look back to her and she'd be like that. And I realized after a time that she was actually not just listening to us, but she was learning words from us. And one great example was I had said one day, I can't find my keys. I can't find my keys anywhere. And, and she went off and looked through my bag, my gym bag, my pockets of my jackets until she found my keys. And then she just put them on the floor. Like, I thought, okay, that's handy. What else does she know? Um, but she did know a lot about how we felt. She was very empathetic. Um, we lived with a rabbit in our house and the rabbit was box litter box trained like a cat. And she knew that when the rabbit got sick, which he did get sick, eventually he had cancer, but she sensed it, you know, probably by smell, but she knew so much about so many things and she took care of us so well. We were transferred abroad and we went to a German speaking country and she learned German. And that's when I went, okay. Cause she had to take a test all in German. Um, they're very strict about the training your dog there. And her test was in German and she passed it with flying colors. So how did she do that? As uh, I was, so I, I did some research on dog abilities and there was a border collie named Casper who knew over, over a thousand words. And he lived with an animal behaviorist, uh, not a trainer, just someone who stand, studied animal behavior. And he said, we have no idea how, how many, you know, what their language skills are or what intelligence really is, but we really greatly underestimate these dogs we live with and what they're capable of. So that's why 630 is in the book because he's commenting on us from an anthropo anthropological point of view. Yeah, I loved his narrative in the book. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes, Laura, Laura Beth's dog is, he's so cute. Is it a he or she, Laura Beth? I don't. This is Hugo. Oh, Hugo. Hugo. Oh my gosh, you're adorable. He crashes oh. many Zooms, so it's oh. just. Oh my yeah. God. what a face. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I loved 630s, like clearly, yes, the dog was smart and he knew all of these words, but I loved the narrative portion of hearing his thoughts and, you know, 
keeping the baby corralled and doing all of those things. He was his own character in the book and in the story. And I can't wait to see him on TV too. Yeah, me too. I don't know how they're going to handle his thoughts yet. Um, and I think they're a little panicked about it, honestly, um, because we don't want him to talk. So I'm not sure how they're going to communicate if they're going to have closed captioning or whatever of what he's thinking, but it'll be interesting to see how they handle it. It's a tough problem. Well, closed captioning works for me because when I'm watching TV with my kids in the room, I always have closed captioning on me because too. half the time I can't hear what they're saying. I know, me too. I, you know, I live in London and the, so you watch, you know, a British show and you go, I have to have, I can't understand the accents. So you have to have it on. Um, well, I think half of, you know, half of the people um, or a lot of people actually listen to this as an audio book. And I have to say, it was so fantastic. The narration was so well done. Did you have a, a hand in picking up the narrator and um, what yeah, chose the specific one? Yeah, um, well, Brie Larson was going to read the book, but she did not have time. She was shooting Captain Marvel at the time. So she had to pass on it. And so there were, I think we had audition tapes from five actresses in London. Now they all had British accents, but they could all do American accents so flawlessly. Um, the only thing that Miranda did was she mispronounces Jack LaLanne's name wrong. Um, I've gotten some complaints about that from the United States and I hadn't noticed because I haven't listened to it. Um, but apparently she says Jack Lalon or Lalon, um, which isn't correct, but she did a great job. Um, and it was really interesting to see the actresses who wanted to do the reading because they were all, you know, really good actresses. But um, Miranda, I thought, did the nicest version of it. So it was fun to, yeah, we, I definitely got to choose who read. So that was fun. Yeah, I could see a, a 60s female, like for whatever, whatever that it sounds like, she sounded like. So it worked. I know, I thought so too. I thought so too. Some of the other readers were, I, I thought, well, you know, I don't know who you're doing, but it's it's not Elizabeth Zott, but I thought Miranda did a great job. Um, she did. Laura Beth had asked, did you get a choice in the cover? <laughs> you're the third group has asked me that. It's so funny. I um no, well, I did. I got I got to have input into the cover. Um, so every nation gets to have their own cover, and I have 38 nations. A lot of them adopt a cover that exists in order to a save money and b because um, they realize it, it's a book that that touches a lot of people in the same way. So the British cover is is all over Europe, except for Estonia, which has its own cover, or Italy has its own cover, or France has its own cover, um, and then the United States, of course, always does their own cover, and they all let me have input which was very, very generous of them because they don't always allow authors to do that. And um, the US cover was probably the most contentious cover. And um, um, I don't know, you know, it's been, it's been really, really interesting to see all of these publishers know their readers. So they base their, their covers based on that. But I think with my book, what they're finding in the US is it's too female a cover. Um, because the book is attracting a much wider male audience, which is great than they had assumed. So you might see a few changes in the future on the cover. <laughs> okay. I mean, you know, I mean, sometimes it does change when it goes to paperback. So, I mean, right. I don't know if that's exactly it. Yeah. And I, I would assume we were assuming on the paperback, it would have Brie Larson on the cover um, because it'll be getting close to the series, but maybe not. It might, so there might be a change in cover before that, but um, it's really based on their market research and how they, how they decide how a uh, cover reads to certain groups of people. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense. Yeah. Um, was the title always Lessons in Chemistry? No, the title changed the night before the Frankfurt auction. Uh, the original title was Introduction to Chemistry because I wanted Elizabeth just to be opening the world of chemistry to her viewers. But um, unfortunately, the name kept getting shelved in nonfiction in the Frankfurt Book Fair catalog. And the night before the Frankfurt Book Fair, and you know, we'd all agreed on this title. Felicity Blunt, my agent called me and she said, we have to change the title right away. <laughs> I said, okay, um, I understand. Okay, and she goes, how about, um, how about lessons in chemistry? And I said, great. And she goes, okay, done. 
<laughs> so that's how that's where that came from. I really owe her. Yeah, that that happened quickly and on the fly. I'm glad that it worked out. I love the title. Yeah, our hearts are both pounding. We had to get that title in you know in three minutes. So. Yeah. Well, if anybody else wants to chime in, be thinking about a question. I'm going to. Laura Beth had just said, uh, "How long did it take you to write this novel?" Five years. Five years. Um, and and then you know it takes another two years to get it through the agent editing pre-promotion it's it's incredibly slow but you realize you know like I would send um, Felicity a draft of the book and she might not get back to me for six months I mean there's this huge lag time in publishing it's because they're reading everybody else's books uh, or they have a life where you know they have kids and things don't go or there's COVID um so yeah there's there's this it goes very slowly, but then you realize once you're in it, why? Um, and then so it does feel like it takes forever. <laughs> so I'm glad to say it's out now, but it's been done for a long time. Wow, five years. And it's been done for a long time now. That's, it is crazy to think about how the, the back works of how publishing actually works and how long it takes for a book. Like once it's done for us to actually get to read it. Yeah, the, um, the, the standard for a book like mine is 18 months once once the publisher has it 18 months from the day the publisher buys it then it will hit the shelves that's a long time but now i i understand just all of the promotion that has to come before the cover the copy editing you know the design work it's a lot it takes a long time oh laura beth also asked what was your favorite part of all of this process being done um, pu publication day was probably, um, April 5th was probably the day that will live in my memory as the very best day, just knowing it was finally done because you, you just keep working right up until the end. And now I'm working on post promotion, which is a different animal, but it's so much better to be on this side of the fence. I can't tell you. <laughs> so I'm, I'm thrilled. April 5th, my favorite day. Definitely. Um, did anybody else want to come off mute and ask Bonnie a question before we wrap things up? Well, I just posted this, but I'll ask what, what are you reading right now, Bonnie? Oh, well, you know, I will tell you I'm reading. Well, I just finished a book. I'll tell you about that. I, I love, but it won't be out till June. Um, and it's called the second sight of Zachary Cloudsley. Uh, it's, it's a British book. If you like, um, kind of a very elegantly written story that's sort of like half J.K. Rowling, half Dickens, half feminist fable, you will like this book. Um, it's really, really well done. And let's see, what else did I, I just finished, um, oh my gosh, I love Sigrid uh, Nunes, and I just finished her latest one, which is I gotta get the name wrong. I wrote, I read The Friend and then I read um, What Are You Going Through or something. I think that's what the name of it is. And it's it's really, really excellent. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll look up the right, the you know, confirm the title <laughs> and share it with everybody. Oh, embarrassing. I don't remember the name of her book, but it's really, really good. Um, Andrea said, I know you said the title changed, but did you have any other plot changes to the book before you published? Like, you know, from your first draft to the final draft is, was it pretty similar or? When I finished the draft that I gave Felicity um, and we were, I, right before we went to Frankfurt on that same night, I said, I still don't feel quite good about the ending. And she said, don't worry about it. Cause you're going to have these editors who want to, you know, get their fingers into the into this cake. So, you know, don't worry about it. They'll, they'll want to make changes. And I thought, oh, changes. But I knew that ending, I knew I needed to write it 10 more times. And luckily I talked to a lot of editors um, who wanted to buy the book. But one of the editors I talked to said, I want to talk to you about the ending. And I went, do you think it needs work? And she goes, yeah. And I said, me too. That's how I chose her. Because that's, she saw it exactly the same way I did. Mm -hmm. but the well, rest really stayed the same honestly um felicity and i worked on it quite a bit um but not not i mean it seems like seems like it took forever but really it, there there's those long spaces where she needs 
you know, she's got a family, she's really busy, she has a million other writers. They're just these long spaces where the writer is just waiting. And so for me, I was probably waiting to, for her to get back. It's always the worst part for the writer is waiting for your agent's comments. But then, you know, her comments are always like, I don't know about this dog. You know, she would just say something like that. Or I don't know about blah, blah, blah. What do you think? And it wasn't like they really change your work or edit it. They just go, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> and then you think, and it's really good that, that they spur you on to do that. So that was great. And then you think, and you say, no, 630 has got to stay. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that one, that one was actually quite contentious between her and I, because she really didn't like it. Hilariously, one of her sisters is a vet and she said, I love the dog. Um, but she said, she's a vet. Of course, she's going to say that. Um, but yes, yeah, Felicity was really worried about having almost like a supernatural element in it. And mm -hmm. I said, you know, I understand that you would consider it super uh, natural. I consider it imagination, but I also consider this is the way scientists think. They have to imagine something that we don't know yet. And then they test this theory and see if it's true. And in terms of a dog understanding words, that is a true theory that has been proven. So uh -huh. that's how he got to stay. I was able to prove it to her. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so glad that you did. Well, Bonnie, um, so to wrap this up, is there any, I know that, uh, is there any details that you can give us about what you're currently working on or is there a timeline or any, just whatever you can tell us? Okay, yeah, no, I, I am working on another novel. I was just on Good Morning America and for some reason, Deb Roberts said that my new novel would be out next year and my editors texted me like, great. And I went, I never said that. I, I never said that. And they said, yeah, we know. I, I, we don't know where she came up with um, that. And actually I'm going to be on Instagram live with her tomorrow, but um, I am working on another novel. It's not a sequel to Lessons in Chemistry, um, but I really like it. And so I'm excited about it. And I tell you about it, except that when I have so much trouble explaining Lessons in Chemistry, that it's just better off if I say nothing, honestly. <laughs> it's too confusing. Awesome. That's okay too. I, you've got a lot of fans in the Peloton Moms Book Club. I'm sure we're going to check out whatever you do next and hopefully that we get to read it sooner rather than later, but we will just cross our fingers for next year. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thanks. Okay. Well, it's been so nice to speak yeah. with you guys this evening. I really appreciate it. I was so excited when they said Peloton Moms. I thought, how cool is that? Do you guys actually do a lot of Peloton work? Oh, uh, everybody in the group has a Peloton. And so we talk about Peloton. We all have our favorite instructors. So uh -huh. books and bikes, that's, that's wow. what it's about. So. Oh, I love it. I think that's, that is, that's great. I mean, it'd be wonderful. I, yeah. I, I've, I've done Peloton a couple of times. It's hard and I'm very competitive. So I always have to get, get ahead of, you know, ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I know some of us have our fingers crossed for Peloton Rower. Every once in a while, we'll hear the rumor mill starting up that there might be one coming. So we'll see. But um, Bonnie, thank you so much for your time and coming to chat with us. We appreciate your insights. We wish you the best of luck um, with the continued publicity of Lessons in Chemistry. And thank you so much. Have a well, wonderful evening. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Bye. guys. Bye-bye.